All right, let's open up our Bibles to James chapter 4. As we're breezing right along through the book of James. We are, we'll focus on verse 5 today. Uh, we covered verse 4 a couple weeks ago, and we'll talk, we'll actually talk about verse 6 possibly a couple of weeks. But uh, the reason being, I think I want to take each verse, you know, as they stand alone, but we also got to remember what they stand with, and that's the other verses around it, so we're looking at the context as well. Um, but we'll focus on James chapter 4, verse 5 today, and... Uh, if you got your Bibles there, we'll read 4 through 6. If we can get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. If you ain't got a Bible with you, we got them in the pews. That It makes everything go a little bit better and help you understand and follow along as well. James chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. It says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you again for this blessed day. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bless the teaching of your word this morning. Lord, that you'll open up our hearts, our minds, and ears. Lord, that we hear what you have to say. Lord, we don't hear Dennis Crosland's voice, but Lord, we hear you. We hear you speaking and telling us how we need to respond to what's said here this morning. And Lord, we want to thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that he died for our sins. Lord, he's the reason for everything. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. So, I'll have to say, uh, looking at verse 5 is a hard verse to... Uh, to comprehend at times, to hard verse to understand, and if you read different commentaries, it's hard to find a couple that agree. And so, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to be dogmatic about because there's some things that are uncertain. One thing is, when the Bible was written, there was no punctuation and no capitalization. So when we think, see things like the word the Spirit, you know, in the King James, it's not capitalized, which means it's just... A spirit, maybe the spirit of man. But in those other translations where that word is capitalized, meaning God's Holy Spirit. And so there, and that changes the meaning between the translations. And so we can't really be sure exactly what the verse means in its full context. And so I'm going to try to do the best that I can to tell you what I think. And I will give you some other uh, perspectives on what other people think as well. And so, looking at some different interpretations of this scripture, a theologian and, and geologist actually named Henry Morris, he paraphrases the verse like this. Do you think that the scriptures are speaking in vain when they testify that God's Holy Spirit, who is now actually, actually dwelling in us, is longing for us to envy, that is to covet after, God's love and friendship rather than of the world? And so he's saying that God's Holy Spirit is within us and it's longing for us to long for Him, to long for God more than the things of this world. And I think you could it's easy to gather that interpretation from it. And, and real quick, the reason, when you look at the word lusteth here in the King James, it's not really a good translation because it really means to desire for, to long for. The other places where this same Greek word is used, Paul especially is using it to say, I long to be with you, when he's writing to people in some of the epistles. And so that's what that word there really means. And then I look at my interpretation of this verse, I would, I would phrase it this way. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain that God's Holy Spirit desires us with a godly jealousy? And then you could also look at another interpretation of it in that the spirit that it's talking about is talking about man's spirit, the life that is in him, not the Holy Spirit that he's indwelled with, but his spirit, his life, basically his flesh lusts or longs enviously for the things of this world. And we could gather that from the context. But I think for me, as I've prayed about it, I look at it as God's 
is longing for us jealously. And that's where you get into what the whole verse of Scripture says. And so to get into that, it says, Do you think that the Scriptures saith in vain? So it's not mentioning a specific Scripture. There's a lot of people that have tried and say, Well, maybe he's quoting this verse, or maybe he's quoting this verse. And I think what James is doing here, he's being generic in that he's looking at the whole of the Old Testament Scriptures and what they, the whole of the Old Testament Scriptures say generically. Now, he can't really be quoting anything in the New Testament because a lot of people think James was the first book of the New Testament that was written. So James is possibly going off a lot of the hearsay or, or the vocal tradition, the oral tradition that he's heard from the time of Jesus' death. And so it, they did have the Old Testament written down. And so I look at a theme of the Old Testament that is very prevalent is God's jealousy. And we'll talk about that. But he says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us? Now, Tony mentioned this this morning in the Sunday school class that was out here. Did we have, did, did people who followed God have the Holy Spirit before Pentecost? And yes, they did. Now, there's some that would, we often like to kind of disregard the work of God's Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. When we have it all the way back into Genesis, I actually did something on Sunday nights here a while back covering how God's Holy Spirit was through the whole of Scripture and not just from Pentecost on in the New Testament. We've got God's Spirit moved across the waters in Genesis 1. We've got how Saul had God's Spirit and then God took that Spirit away. David had God's Spirit. The Spirit of God would come upon Samson you know, and, and come upon other fighters for God in the Old Testament. So God's Spirit was there. And so God's Spirit was was within us. It's not a foreign concept to the Old Testament. So Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 26 and 27 say this, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So this is Ezekiel prophesying, God's going to put a new spirit within you. Uh, there's also scriptures talking about when Moses was on Mount Sinai and they said, hey, we don't know where Moses is at, the one that God put his spirit within. And so that's talking about the Holy Spirit being inside or, or overcoming maybe, or overwhelming the believers of God. And then David mentions in Psalm 51, he's, at, he's begging God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. That's Psalm 51, 11. So, this is not a foreign concept to the Old Testament. So James is speaking right here, not that we would question him, but he says that the Spirit that dwelleth in us, and it goes right along with the New Testament and things like John 15 and John 14 and how we abide in the Spirit and the Spirit abides in us and we abide in Christ. And, and Jesus said that I would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to teach you, to convict you, to exhort you, to encourage you. And so that theme runs throughout the whole of Scripture about God's Spirit dwelling within us. And now, God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we know as Trinitarians, one of those big theological words that we believe in the Trinity of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we know that God the Holy Spirit is God. And so, if His Spirit that He puts within us is God, His Holy Spirit, we can look at James 4, 5, says, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy or desires us. And so another theme, like I said, that runs throughout the Old Testament is God's desire for His people, His jealousy for His people. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus this morning. Exodus 34. Now if you've read much of the Old Testament, you know that it talks about how God is jealous for His people. Exodus 34, verses 14 through 16. And this is by far not the first mention of God's jealousy. But uh, I, th I think it's the, the most convenient this morning and most timely, I feel, for, uh, for what we're talking about. Exodus 34, verses 14 through 16. He says, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous 
is a jealous God lest I make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. Now I also want to mention that when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, when he said thou shalt have no other gods before me, the commentary on that verse by God himself in Exodus 20 was, I am a jealous God. I desire my people. And so we are His people this morning. And so He's jealous for us. Now, in looking at Exodus 34, 14 through 16, of course, He even gives as one of the names for God, jealous. But then He says, lest I make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. We know that they were getting ready to go into Canaan. Uh, and the problem or the issue at stake was, you're going to go into Canaan, there's some other folks there. Now, for one, I want you to displace them. I want you to take them out so you can be holy and set apart from me as you serve me in this land, the holy land, the land of milk and honey, Canaan. And he implores them. He said, look, don't make a covenant with them. Don't fellowship with them. Don't sacrifice to their gods. Don't eat of their sacrifice. And so as we've been talking about in James 4 and the conflict that we have as Christians with the worldly institutions, the worldly temptations, the worldly sins, the things that would try to knock us off our path in following God, the things that would distract us, the things that would take us away from God. And this is exactly the thing that God was talking to Moses about. He said, they have their own institutions, the way they do things in this land. Don't succumb to it. Don't fall to it. Don't give in to it. Don't make no covenant with them. Don't fellowship with them. You know, and it goes to the phrase, and the, the Scripture says, be in the world, not of the world. And so we have all these things that's pulling at us in this day and time. And what we have to remember is that God is a jealous God. God desires us enviously. He wants us to serve Him. And, and I go back to... You look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, one of the oldest confessions in the world, in that what is the duty of man? Why did God create man? And what it says to honor and enjoy him forever, to serve him forever. God created humans for him, not for us. He did not create us for our own self-interest. He did not create us so we could go out into the world and do whatever we desired. Our desire is to be for Him. Now there's a lot of people in the world, the world especially, those outside of the Christian faith, can't understand that. They'll say, you do you. Or you do what you want. Or you live how you want. Just do it. If it feels good, do it. That's what we've talked about earlier in this chapter, in James chapter 4. But that's not why we were created. That's not why Jesus Christ sent His Son to die for us, not so we could keep on sinning and living like the world. It is all completely, 100%, unequivocally for Him and for His glory. That's why we're here. That's why we were able to open our eyes this morning. That's why we were able to take in a breath. That's why we were able to get up and come to church. That's why we were able to take in all the sights that we see. It's why we are. He is our being. Everything that we have and are is wrapped up in Him. It should be. But that's not necessarily the case in the Christian world today. You know, we even, we even come to the point where, you know, we may look and say, the United States, because... Let's talk about Western Christianity. It's not really true biblical Christianity for the most part. And we'll say the United States is a Christian nation. Well, then we got a lot of people who says it's no longer a Christian nation. There's some people that say it never was. But when Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits, when we look at the world around us and what's going on, they're right, we're not a Christian nation. Not now. Because those who profess belief in Jesus Christ, we're the outcasts, we're the outliers which that's the way it's meant to be. Jesus promised us we'd be like that. He said the world will hate you. But we want to be liked by the world. And so to do that, we've got to be of the world and do the things that the world requires or the world desires us to do when our desire should be for God. And so when we look at God's jealousy in the Old Testament, 
We see it a lot. I think this is, this is what we go to first is God's wrath. Because His jealousy over His people caused them to be in subjection during the periods of the judges. Okay, the Philistines, the Amalekites, and, and all those folks would come and take them into captivity or put them under oppression. We see God's jealousy in His wrath and judgment upon the northern kingdom when Assyria came in and took them captive. We see it when Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon came and took the, the people in Judah captive. And so we want to think of God's jealousy as His wrath, and it's true. Okay, the, the people that call themselves by His name, the people that call themselves Christians today, we can expect God's wrath when we turn away from Him. That's a given. We see it in the Old Testament. They could expect God's wrath. God told them on the beginning, look, you follow me, you keep my commandments, we'll have a good relationship. But when you turn away, He says, I'm going to turn away from you. So God's jealousy led to wrath upon those who would claim His name, but yet not follow it up with action. He showed His wrath on those that were enemies of God. Okay, and we see that, you know, even in the judges. And all through the Old Testament, yeah, He might would use them to punish Israel, but then when Israel would repent, He would punish them. Now, a lot of people look at that and they'll say God is very fickle and He can't make up His mind or He's bipolar. This is something that people will say. And of course, none of them are professed Christians, but they'll say that. They'll use that and what they do, it's their own pride. They don't want to submit to God, period. So they'll distort the image of God to suit them where they can feel good about disparaging God and His followers. But not only do we see the wrath of God in His jealousy, we see His grace in His jealousy. That's where we go back to James chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, He giveth more grace. Okay, He, he talks about this. Look, He desires you. He, he, he longs for you enviously. But yet He giveth more grace because He knows that the world is tugging at us. You Remember, we talked about in James chapter 3 where we can't tame the tongue. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our faults. That we can't do this. So He gives us more grace. And we'll talk quite a bit next week about how much grace He gives us. So if, if you're in Exodus now, turn to Deuteronomy. Just a couple books over. You've got Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Okay, so this is in the Old Testament. I'm trying to get the contrast here, especially because in the Old Testament, God, people want to say He's just a God of wrath. And that's part of who God is. God is just. God is fair. And so we look later on in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and He says some of the same things. Chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, He says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. Talking about these other gods. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, this shows us something too, that sin, turning away from God, that affects the next generation. You know, that's why, you know, we can look at now, this country is suffering from the sins of the people turning away from God in the future, or the past generations. People not following God like we need to. People not humbling themselves before God like they need to. But then he says in verse 10, and showing mercy unto those of them that love me and keep my commandments. And so this shows that mercy and this grace that God shows. Why? Because of his jealousy for us. His desire for us. His desire for us to follow him. Now, the, both sides of his jealousy, the wrath and the mercy, I feel like is wrapped up in the New Testament in the word propitiation. Okay, it's used a few times throughout the New Testament, but the key verse I want to focus on is in Romans 3. So, if you'll turn there to Romans 3, and we'll look at verses 23 through 26. And while you're turning there, just to define propitiation, uh, if you look in like the Strong's Concordance, it says it's an atoning sacrifice. What that means is this propitiation, 
fulfilled God's wrath. Okay? If uh, he pronounced, say someone pronounces a uh, sentence, a punishment on somebody, and when that is filled, it's propitiation. It fulfills that sentence, the sentence that has been handed down. But when we look in the terms of Jesus Christ, he fulfilled God's wrath that was required for the punishment of sin. But it wasn't Jesus's to take. It was ours. And so Jesus, that propitiation, filled that. So in Romans 3, verses 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, I think mo a lot of us are familiar with that verse. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sin that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And so... When we look at those verses, we know, yes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All need salvation. All have to pay for their sin. There has to be a payment made. And that payment was made by Jesus Christ by shedding His blood. The propitiation. So in that, He fulfilled God's wrath upon us. So He fulfilled God's wrath for us. Took everything that we were owed, everything that we deserved, Okay, that's one thing I think that gets left out. What we deserved is what Jesus got. What we currently deserve is what Jesus got. So Jesus is fulfilling God's wrath and His mercy at the same time here. Because God loves us. Okay, when we want to talk about John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He did that because of love. But he did that because there was some justice that had to be done. Some judgment that had to be fulfilled. But he did it by showing mercy towards us. And so, as said many, many times, God's acts towards us ought to influence us. Ought to push us to do things for him. And so as God is jealous for us, He desires us. And we ought to do the same for Him. 1 Kings 19.10, talking about Elijah. And this is the backside of a very common story with Elijah. You know, he had just defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And he's running because Jezebel wants to have him killed. And he's nervous. He's scared. He had done many great things for God. And God's... Asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And in verse 19, chapter 19, verse 10, says, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And so Elijah's saying, Look, I have been very jealous. For you And what he does and what he's saying here and, and saying very jealous, he's taking the Hebrew word for jealous and using it twice. And so we translate that as very jealous. And literally, Elijah's saying, I've been jealous, jealous for you. And we see that in the actions and the things that he had done, the way that he had followed God. I mean, he really stuck his neck out in saying, look, I'm going to challenge these prophets of Baal and, you know, pouring water on a fire and then calling God to bring down fire and, and strike that altar on fire. I mean, that's sticking your neck out. And if he lost, what would probably happen, Jezebel was going to kill him anyway. And so he was very jealous for God. In, in the midst of all the things that he had seen, he said, look, Israel has forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars, slain your prophets with the sword. I'm the only one left. But I've been very jealous for you. And so we look at that, what about us today? And we can, we can take those very same things that he described as Israel and apply that to the United States and what we've done and what we continue to do. And so we've got to be the ones who are very jealous for God and His ways, His doctrine, His truth, and we ought to stand for it. 
You know, when we look at it, it says, Israel's forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars. Okay, they destroyed everything that has, is the foundation of Christianity in this country for the most part. You know, you see, me and Melinda was talking about this briefly as we was driving to Lebanon. We took up some back roads coming home and stuff because fair traffic in Lebanon is horrendous. So if you can stay away from Lebanon, do so. But anyway, you, it's, it's easy to see a lot of old churches that are for sale, that closed down because of a couple of things. One, people are just not that religious anymore. And... and and I say that in the sense that religious is not a bad word. It's just putting your faith into practice. Uh, I heard something, a story there was a, somebody asked, uh, and I can't remember the context, but somebody asked some folks there, who enjoys religion? And somebody answered, the ones that got it do. And that's not talking about the traditions. That's just talking about the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. We can enjoy that. And a lot of people don't have that anymore. We was driving through Temperance Hall the other day. There's a, there's a little church right off the old square there. It's got a for sale sign in the yard there. And so people are turning away from God in humongous numbers. Or some people are turning, they want to go to the bigger churches for whatever reason. I, I think when, I have my own misgivings about bigger churches a lot of times. I think the fellowship suffers. Sometimes I think the doctrine suffers. Not all the time. But that's what people are going to. We don't have this personal sharing faith in Jesus Christ that we used to have anymore. So they've torn down thine altars. They've slain the prophets with the sword. Now, in this country, people who preach the word are not being killed physically, but they're being destroyed socially. People look for anything they can do to discount what they preach. Or they just try to shut them up. Keep it in your home. Keep it in the church. So as Elijah, he used the word jealous twice to make his point. We can look through all, out, all throughout Scripture where people were jealous for God. We can look throughout all of history, even outside of the Bible, where people were jealous for God. But just an example or two, David was jealous for the Lord in fighting Goliath. Now, David, he had his failings. We know about it. His sin with Bathsheba, uh, you know, Psalm 51, as I mentioned earlier, is because of his sin. He was heartbroken over the things that he had done and the punishment, the wrath that God had given him for turning away from God from that moment in time. But his reason for fighting Goliath, what was it? Was it defending Israel? No. Wasn't defending Israel. First Samuel seventeen forty five, and and Goliath had called out to David, insulting him. You send a boy out here. But verse forty five. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, with God, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. You have defied the God of the armies of Israel. Not so much the armies of Israel, but you're defying God. That's what David was standing up for. Because he talked about this Philistine that's shouting blasphemies towards God. This uncircumcised Philistine talking about what he don't know about. Shouting these blasphemies against God, putting God down, putting down his people. That's why David fought. And also a reason why David fought, because everybody else was scared to. They didn't want to go fight the Goliath. We look back in, in the book of Numbers when they're supposed to go over into Canaan and they sent the spies, the twelve spies. Ten of them was scared. Caleb and Joshua wasn't. We need the people like Caleb and Joshua. We need the people like David. We need the people like Peter and James and John, Stephen, to stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we want to go out and we want to stop these things that's going on to the world. And we see all kinds of sin out there, whether it be abortion, whether it be the way the sexuality is pervaded into the culture and just everything's inundated by it. How do we stop it? It's not so much standing up against those things, but standing up for Jesus Christ because people are not going to change their minds until Jesus Christ changes their heart. 
And they can't do that unless they hear the gospel. And it takes a preacher. That's not talking about just me. That's talking about every one of you in here who can read and understand the Bible, who can hear my voice, who can go out into the world and talk to people. That's how they are to hear the gospel. The book of Jude, verse 3. Jude, the brother of Jesus, says this, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So what are we to do? We are to, we are to earnestly contend for the faith that was delivered to us. We have it in the Holy Scriptures. God has revealed Himself to us. He's revealed what Jesus Christ has done for us through the Holy Scriptures. We are to contend for that. We are to stand up for that. We see the example in Scripture. We see it throughout history. And we see the need for it today. We need people that will earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly contend for the gospel and what it is. Every aspect of it. We need to stand for right doctrine. We need to stand for churches being actual churches and standing up for each other and with each other and fellowshipping with each other. Do it because we're jealous with a godly jealousy. And there is a such thing. Uh, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 11 real quick. But Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians 11 verses 1 and 2. Would to God that ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And so what's commonly happened with Paul and the people that he preached to and the letters that he wrote, that he would preach the gospel to them, there would be converts, there would be churches started, but then somebody else would come in and pervert the gospel. It happened in Corinth. It happened to the Galatians. It happened to almost everybody. It happened to the Thessalonians. You name it. If he wrote a letter to them, there were people that are trying to change the gospel of God. And in the book of Galatians, he said, let them be accursed that try to do that. But he said he was jealous over them with a godly jealousy in that he wanted them to follow the right gospel, the right doctrines, the right Jesus. Not some other Jesus that somebody else may be coming to preach one that maybe demanded that they be circumcised or show these works, or some that allowed them to live in lasciviousness and sin and licentiousness. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the Savior Jesus Christ that God has showed us in the Bible. And so we need to have that godly jealousy for God, and then that also ought to spread to each other. We want to want everybody here that we fellowship with in a Christian context to live fully in a Christian context, to follow God as He would have us to follow Him, to not follow after the world. And that's what James is saying. He says, look, God desires you to follow Him. That's why He made you. That's why He sent His Son to die for you. But we can look at it's not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to happen. That's where He gives us more grace. But he says in verse 6, Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He wants the people that will humble themselves to him, not be proud and resist him, and give in to the world. That's why we're here. To follow and serve God. So this morning, as Cleet and Cheryl come up for the invitation, if you have a need this morning, uh, if you need to pray over something, if you need help in anything, you know, just let us know. If you need to be born again, if you need to rededicate yourself, we can steer you in that direction. We can't do it for you. But God is a jealous God. That's a theme throughout Scripture. And He's jealous for us. It wasn't just Israel. He wants us to follow Him. That's what He demands. Be ye holy for God is holy. That's what He's called us to know less than that. Let us stand and sing. 376. 376.